We're delighted to have you here today. I'm Catherine Ross, the Executive Director of the Center for Teaching and Learning, and I am thrilled to be kicking off the 10th anniversary celebration of the Provost Teaching Innovation Grants. Very exciting. So we're gonna start with our panel conversation with our wonderful guests who have so generously offered to be here today. And then we, at four o'clock, we will move into the rotunda and hear from Senior Vice Provost Suleiman Kachani, who will be honoring all the people who've done the work on these innovation grants. So that just gives you a little idea of how this is all gonna flow. All right, so we will now commence with our panel. I'll invite our panelists to come up here. Two of our panelists are, as you can see, joining us remotely today. <clears throat> this was a weather-induced last-minute change, so we're going to make this work. All right, so first I'm going to ask our panelists to introduce themselves, and we'll start with Laurel, and then go to Susan, and then we'll move into the room. Hello, and thank you for the opportunity to zoom in. I'm also recovering from a cold, so excuse my voice. Um, my name is Laurel Daniels Abruzizi. I'm an associate professor in the programs in physical therapy, which is part of Vagilis College of Physicians and Surgeons up at the Medical Center campus. I also am director of our Performing Arts Fellowship and director of DEI for our program. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I'm honored to be part of this panel. My name is Susan Witte. I'm a professor at the School of Social Work. And I think it's very fitting at the 10th year anniversary that we were actually challenged to be innovative in the way in which this presentation came together. Hi, I'm Jay Saitharaman. I'm a faculty member in the Industrial Engineering and Operations Research Department at Columbia Engineering. Um, I've been at Columbia for 25 years now. I'm currently the chair of the department as well. Thank you for having me. Hi, I'm Brent Stockwell. I'm the chair of the Department of Biological Sciences. I'm also in chemistry and pathology, <coughs> and I teach biochemistry, and I've been here for 20 years. So it's great to be here. All right, our first question. So we use the word innovation a lot in higher ed, maybe too much, I don't know. Um, but what I'm really interested in is how has your work with the provost-funded grants um, and the projects that you have brought to life sort of deepened your ideas maybe about innovation or changed your ideas about when, what innovation in teaching can mean? Um, and what do these, you know, what do innovations look like in your classes? So I think we'll start in the room this time. So I'll start with Brent, and then we'll go to Jay, and then Susan will do the reverse, and then Laura. Great. No, it's a great question. Uh, something I think a lot about innovation. I think what I've learned over the years since that first grant, uh, Provost uh, Grant, is that it's, it's a lot about finding the the challenge that students are having with some specific concept and trying to figure out a new way to get that across to them or maybe some difficulty you can see they're having in the classroom. So, you know, it can be as simple as um, students are struggling to maintain focus, they're not able to really digest all the information by the end of the classroom, by the end of a particular class. And so an innovation, actually this is probably the greatest innovation I introduced over 10 years, is just having the students work in groups, in teams, for about 20 minutes at the end of class to solve problems together. I think that's been the most impactful of everything that I've done. They love that change to the class. So for me, that solved that issue of fatigue and difficulty mastering some of these concepts because they became so interactive. So that's, that's sort of what I've taken from it. Thank you, Brent. That's great. A simple, very, seemingly very simple thing with big results. Yeah, I, I agree with, uh, with what, what Brent said uh, a lot. Um, I think, uh, I mean, I think of innovation as occurring at multiple levels. Uh, so there is, at the level of lecture, it's how to better explain a concept or 
coming up with a simple illustrative example that captures all sorts of ways in which people might misunderstand something and to clarify you know, what, what exactly we are trying to introduce. Um, I think one of the things I learned from the grant is also to build in uh, some space and room in the schedule to experiment and uh, also to just plan on some of this failing to, to make sure that there is that that doesn't somehow derail the entire class so that you at least I got a sense of what works and what doesn't uh, Brent mentioned problem solving sessions so one of the years we experimented with having about a third of the lectures converted to tutorial sessions uh, I should say a sixth of the lectures converted to tutorial sessions where students work on problems in groups uh, but one of the things that occurred was uh, that even though you tell them they don't have to go through the entire sheet, there was a sense that three students would divide up the work in some way and focus on different problems, which wasn't really meant, uh, that, that wasn't meant to happen. So to be able to make the sort of adjustments that any new ideas you try, I thought that was an important uh, thing to do. And of course, at a higher level, I, I feel you know, concepts that are important to, to make sure that they show up multiple times within a course uh, and also at a curricular, curriculum design level so to sort of structure courses in such a way that many of these important ideas are reinforced multiple times. So, uh, so I, I think it's, it's helpful to sort of be intentional and think about these at different levels. Mm -hmm. and that I found was uh, quite beneficial for me. Yeah, that's very interesting, a layering approach, sort of micro level to macro level, yeah. All right, Susan. Okay, let's see. I agree with everything that's already been said. And what's so interesting is how innovation can take so many different forms. So, um, so for me, I wanted to just sort of do a shout out in the Wayback Machine to uh, Frank Moretti and Maurice Matisse and some of the CCA and MTL, now CTL staff who are here who helped with, with my introduction to innovation. So I saw Stephanie Ogden, I, um, I know, um, Mark Phillipson um, and others are, are still here, Mark Raymond. And um, my introduction through those two, Frank Moretti and Maurice Matisse and the early uh, group was in thinking about how so, so social work, um, social work practice in the classroom is very active. We're, we're trying to teach practitioners who do 21 hours of practicum outside of their two days of classroom work to use ethics and values, to use themselves, to become self-aware, to be reflective, and also to bring in collaborative learning and to learn new evidence-based techniques. Um, the, the CTL innovations allowed me to think about a different way of taking some of those concepts and reflecting them, certainly using digital technologies. And by doing that, I think one of the things that was helpful is realizing that innovation isn't always something that's entirely new and different and sort of a, you know, a shiny object. Sometimes it's rethinking the way you do basic principled and conceptual um, activities. So for me, the, the Provost Grant was to take a tool for social support, which is a very simple concept that all social work students have access to because they understand it as part of their own lives. And by creating a tool and creating a hybrid course around it and learning the, the concepts of active classroom, flipped classroom, et cetera, I was able to engage students more actively in seeing that they don't have to learn sort of an evidence-based practice that's somewhere out there. They actually have the tools to collaborate with their clients in practicum and to take these simple tools to leverage the resources that clients already have to strengthen their work. And that's what social work practice is. So for me, it was rethinking, what does innovation mean? And am I missing simple principles and uh, that, that many of the students are already engaging that, that I'm not helping them strengthen? Thank you, Susan, that, that's great. So looking anew at something and going down into the foundations of it sounds like. Yeah, that's really interesting. All right, Laurel. Oh, well, for me, um, innovative teaching methods would be anything that's helping me bridge the gap between traditional didactic instruction to what's really needed in clinical spaces. 
Um, I, like uh, Susan, I'm teaching um, physical therapy uh, students who are going into clinical practice. My first uh, provost grant was addressing interprofessional collaborative team based care in geriatrics. And we were um, working with nursing students and using iPads to film teams doing team-based assessments with standardized actors. And then they coded those videos and looked back and self-critiqued their teamwork, their patient-centered communication, and got you know immediate feedback after doing um, those avals. And now we have sim labs in the VEC Center and in the, in the in the School of Nursing where rooms are kind of set up for video-based capture of practice and opportunities for reflection and discussion and debriefing. Um, but at the time, 10 years ago, it felt very innovative to do something other than just discuss teamwork or just put people in teams um, and to actually record it and reflect on it and debrief um, in a meaningful way. So for me, that was innovative and continues to be the thread that I look for bridging didactics to clinical practice. Yes, that's it. there's nothing like seeing yourself on video to start reflecting metacognitively about what's happening, right? So that's that's great. Thank you. Thank you all. So we've talked a little now about your how your ideas about innovation have grown and developed, but what the next question wants an answer to is how have these projects that you've worked on changed you as a teacher? Um, has it impacted your teaching more broadly? Um, and what about impacts on your students? How has that unfolded for you? Jay, you're smiling, so let's start with you. <laughs> um, so I, I think the act of writing a proposal and having it funded forces you to actually do work. So that's. That's sort of the first good thing. Um, I think, uh, so f for me, the transformation was, uh, I think it, it made me think uh, more carefully about what I wanted to teach. Uh, more importantly, what I wanted students to take away from, uh, from the class, which oddly, I have to say, for the first six or seven years, I, I, you know, I was only thinking about teaching from my point of view. That I had a certain body of material that I wanted to deliver and I just wanted to do that as best as I could. Um, but as I reflected, I, I sort of realized that the best teachers I had were not necessarily the most polished speakers. They didn't have the best presentation skills. It was more about creating engagement in the classroom to help students get the spirit of discovery somehow, that, they, uh, that rather than presenting things as sort of a finished, well understood body of knowledge, it's to somehow sort of point to parts that you could go in, uh, but maybe they're not productive, or um, maybe invite students to ask questions, question basic definitions, and so on. So I think having this flipped classroom experiment, um, which, we, which we ran for two or so years, uh, opened my mind to these possibilities where students are more actively engaged in the learning process. Uh, that also along with CTL's help, you know, it was clear that we had to do a better job of assessing what was learned, uh, and the exams and other things that we do are only imperfect measures of, um, of what, act, what learning has actually occurred. So I think over the years, I, I feel like I have a better sense of what students are getting out of the class. Uh, I may not cover the material, and that somehow has become less of an issue for me. Uh, instead, um, I think I focus on uh, presenting the, the most basic, most important ideas uh, early enough and giving students the time to engage with it and come back with questions and so on. So that, I, philosophically, that I think uh, is a change that I see. As to what impact this has had on students, uh, I think you should ask them. I'm not sure that uh, I can answer that, yeah. Fair enough. I can't tell you how much I love that you just said covering the material is less important than it used to be. Yes, <laughs> it's wonderful. All right, Brent. Yeah, so I would say one of the most important things I learned in the last 10 years with the support of these grants was actually the importance 
of talking to students when you're teaching. It sounds obvious in a way, or maybe it doesn't. But in the beginning, when I got to Columbia, I would get up, I would give what I thought was a perfectly clear exposition on a topic, and then students, I would give them an exam, and a lot of them wouldn't get it, and would, would get things wrong. I said, didn't I already explain this? I don't understand why they're having trouble. Then I started with the problem solving in class, and they would work in groups, and I would walk around and talk to them, and I would see they had interpreted things I said in a different way, or they didn't understand a term, and they, they thought it meant something different, or these subtle reasons that they didn't really understand what I said. And that was so useful, just to be going around and talking with them about the questions as they solved them. Or another example is, last semester I taught a, a sort of small seminar in biochemistry, which is what I normally teach. And I did it in mixed reality, so we had virtual reality headsets, and we sat together in a classroom all together looking at the same protein objects, virtual objects, so we could talk about them in real time and we could do manipulations of them and try to understand these three-dimensional objects together. And one of the students, I mentioned something about the active site, which is a part of a protein or an enzyme where the chemistry is happening. And we always talk about the active site, and it's like intro bio or even high school biology, you learn the active site. And one of the students said to me after that class, she said, oh, I didn't understand. I always thought the active site was just a part of the sequence where something happened. I didn't realize it's a part of the three-dimensional structure where everything comes together from different parts. It all folds up, and it, the action is in space, not in sequence. So that's something, again, I never would have realized except for the fact of talking to the student and trying to understand the misconceptions. Great. Thank you. It's in some ways very similar to what Jay was saying, right? <laughs> when you start talking with the students, you start to realize that things are unfolding very differently for them than they are for you when you tell them stuff. Yeah. All right, so we'll go to Laurel. Um, well, I agree with Jay. Just the, the process of doing a proposal um, makes you sit and think about the pedagogy and why you're making the changes you're cha making, I think all educators make changes to their courses. But when you apply for one of these grants, you really want to set it up with some sound theoretical framework. Um, think about what you, know, what you want to do and you get a partner to problem solve with and a little external validation that you know, you're on, on the right track of something that might be meaningful. Um, in terms of the impact for the students, I think all of my projects have had some sort of reflection component. You mentioned metacognition. I, I'm a big believer in reinforcing metacog processes and, you know, what am I learning? You know, uh, how will this inform my practice as a clinician? So um, I think that's a thread that's been really reinforced through these projects that will take our students into their clinical work as well. Well, thank you for the shout out for metacognition. We love that. <laughs> All right, Susan. Yeah, so thank you um, uh, for the reminder, Jay, about and uh, Laurel, about going back to the grant proposal and having to write that. But also, it, it reminded me how much I took from the active learning classroom, the, the CTL spaces in which I had never stopped to go back to basics with developing a, a curriculum or syllabus. And to have to do that, to have to link the theory to practice, to have to consider many options of ways to make a classroom more active, um, considering outside the classroom and inside the classroom and ways to flip that. But what it means to create space in a two hours of students together to create stronger relationships and learning um, really changed my ability to trust myself and to trust the students that if they do the work outside, that's always the challenge, getting them to read. So flipping in those discussion questions to make sure they're reading. Then also trusting that they'll take risks in the classroom. Um, they'll, they'll share 
experiences if we're if what we're doing is talking about using social supports in practicum and things that happen when they do assessments um, the, the mistakes that come up and learning from those mistakes uh, I think I think all of us um, my I and my students take more risks and and we we survive them and then we see oh well we can actually learn by by being more vulnerable with each other, sharing practice wisdom. And I think also thinking always about the students as co-learners. So um, critical consciousness theory is something I think I've brought more into my classroom and wanting to make sure that everyone knows that each of the students also brings some practice wisdom that inevitably, once you invite it out, enriches the conversation that's happening in the class. And I think before this, I didn't think as much about that. Um, and my colleagues, Ellen Wu and Kelsey Reeder have talked about liberating the classroom and, and teaching um, not to oppress, but to liberate. And so I hold those concepts as well as I think about these innovations and uh, relational practices that we're talking about. Thank you, Susan. That was very rich. I, I think the sense I'm getting from all of you is what you're describing is creating a community of learning. You're inviting your students into this as community members and really getting everyone focused on the learning and how it unfolds. Thank you for, for those sharing those thoughts. So what advice would you give to someone who has maybe been thinking about applying for a grant or maybe hasn't been thinking about applying for a grant? Like, what would you say to somebody if they came to you and said, should I apply for this grant? You know, I would just say, go for it. I mean, I, I think there's not only your parachute to trust yourself, if you're thinking about doing it, just go for it and trust also that there's a, um, there's a trampoline underneath that the CTL group, the, the provost office group here, have uh, incredible expertise and wisdom to share. And um, I mean, the, the richest thing I've done in my career is to trust to this group, my ideas for scholarship and to have them think about them or actually research my ideas for research and scholarship and to have them help me weave them together. So I would say absolutely go for it and trust that the resources are there to support you and use that interface of asking questions to get the answers that you need in order to finish that grant and to move forward. Thank you. Laura? Yes, I would absolutely say go for it and just know you can take it in baby steps. I mean, start talking to someone in CTL first about your ideas, what you're thinking about. They've worked with so many other partners that if you start talking about things in your classes that you wish you could do differently or problems you'd like to solve, um, they may help you start to identify resources or um, pedagogies uh, that could work. I, I don't recommend going for the shiny new technology, how could I use that? Like with technology first, but thinking of like, what's a problem? Um, and, you know, how can an innovative change solve a problem rather than thinking of how I might use something innovative? Um, but I, there's no downside. Like, even if you don't get the grant, there was one year I applied for one and I, I didn't get it. But that process of talking through it thinking it through, I was still able to execute a small portion of what I had planned without the grant funding and then reapply the next year. So there's really no downside to starting to talk to CTL about your ideas. Um, so absolutely, go for it. Thank you. That's great. I'm glad you mentioned that because we do love to talk to people, you know, even if they ultimately decide not to submit a grant, we, we welcome those early conversations to sort of get the ideas flowing. Um, of course, people should apply. I think uh, <laughs> it's a no-brainer uh, to, to try. I want to uh, underscore what, what was already said about the support that CTL provides. I think more than the money, um, the, the fact that people are willing to spend time, uh, meet with you, discuss your ideas, help, help you sharpen them, that I found very valuable. Uh, I'd also say I think uh, the CTL folks are, the people I've worked with have been very disciplined. I mean, they have a way of uh, structuring these conversations that forces you to do things a particular way. And if you're as undisciplined as I am, you could use more of that. And, and so that I think has, I've found very valuable. 
I'd say uh, most recently I, I taught a, a class for the first time and things didn't go well. And so I did sign up to be part of the Active Learning Institute last summer. And you know, the four day workshop, all I did was write out a detailed set of goals for one unit of my course and I, I thought that was just fantastic. So I feel, I think that there's so much help there is on campus that many of us are not using uh, and I think that is one reason to apply because you're going to be uh, in contact with these folks who are just uh, phenomenal. I think a second reason is that if, if you do get funding, typically there's money to work with, uh, with a colleague or an interested student. Uh, and I think brainstorming ideas with, with, with another person, I think that also is sort of very valuable. And, um, and the, the younger they are and the more uh, interested they are in sharing their ideas, I, I think uh, the better the outcome is. So I've enjoyed that part of uh, the CTL funding as well. I love that, moving teaching into more of a community right. project than just what an individual does in their own classroom with their door shut. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Brent. Yeah, it's an interesting question. So I guess I, I would have two pieces of advice for anyone who wants to do some innovative work in their teaching and apply for these grants as well. Um, the first one is, I'm gonna disagree a little bit with Laurel uh, in terms of the, the approach. I mean, I like to think in science and research, there are two ways to sort of devise a new approach, a new project. One is, yes, you can start with the question and you can think like, what's the problem in the classroom? What is the pedagogical issue, the conceptual problem? And then work your way backward and figure out what do I need to do to solve that problem? So that's definitely a good approach. But I do also think sometimes it's all the same old problems we're all working on and the same old tools and we can't make progress on those until a new technology comes along. So sometimes another way to stimulate that thinking, for me at least, is what, is what are the new technologies that you've seen other people develop or that are coming along in another field? And you ask yourself, is there any application of that to the problems that you're facing? And that sometimes that can stimulate a new idea. So I, I like to come at it from those two perspectives. So that's one piece of advice. The other is that I want to echo the themes we heard about uh, finding a good partner, and that could be someone in CTL, it could be somebody else. I was fortunate to recruit my wife to work with me on some projects. She happens to do randomized controlled clinical trials, which I don't do, obviously, and when we wanted to evaluate these teaching methods, you know, she was a great partner for that. So, but I, I do think the general question of measuring learning is a really hard one. And it's good to find someone to help you, whether it's a statistician or a CTL colleague, um, someone in another department or your own department who thinks about that. But trying to figure out, I mean, it's clear that people learn. And it's just really hard to know how you know what they've learned and when they've learned it. And we can ask these questions and we can do it in different ways. But in the end, it's very difficult to measure learning, in my opinion. So thinking about like how, what are you gonna test, but then how are you gonna measure it in a meaningful way, and, and then what are the right experiments to measure that, or what, what is the, the approach you can use? Finding someone to help you think that through is, I think, fun to work with another person, but also it, it's probably gonna make the project more successful. Yes, measuring learning is something we always are grappling with and trying to think of ways to support instructors who spend all this time doing all this work and innovating in these ways, but then how do we really know if it worked? And if it worked, how did it work? And what exactly was it that they learned from that? Yeah, it's a, it's a ongoing um, learning process for us to figure out how to help all the varied kinds of projects too, right? So. Yes, but we enjoy it enormously. So <laughs> we appreciate people who want to go deep into that inquiry. Yeah, the thing that made me think of that most recently was the 3D models. And we don't normally test thing, questions about 3D understanding. So how would we do that? And how would we really measure that? 
So that, that was another example <coughs> where measuring the 3D understanding is, is a particular challenge, but that's really what we wanted to know. I hope we were helpful. Yes, we were. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I wanted to leave a little time for our audience to ask questions. Uh, so if you would like to ask a question, please raise your hand. And we have a couple people who will deliver a microphone to you. We ask you to use a microphone so that the recording can catch the question and everyone in the room can hear it. I'm curious if anyone has an anecdote um, of some positive feedback or reaction they received from their students if they are willing to go into more detail um, about what it was you employed to get that feedback that others in the room might be inspired by. Who would like to tackle that one? I, I could just share um, for, for one of the, the grants that I received the social support network mapping tool. It's, it's a mini course, seven weeks. It's clinical social work students. And through the process of um, learning how to use a digital version of this tool, the assignments include using it with yourself, using it with a client, identifying an intervention, and then following through with that intervention, but also teaching the tool to another colleague so that they can implement it. So in other words, we're taking the concept of sort of social support and, and network building and implementing it into the assignment so that the student ends up sharing an innovation that goes, you know, each one teach one. And I've had at, at least one or two students each semester speak to the value of learning not only a skill that they can implement with their clients or with themselves, but also learning to teach someone else to use it in such a way that their self-efficacy is built on multiple levels, which becomes more exciting because then they see themselves not only as student learners or not only as practitioners, but also inspired teachers of others and sort of mentors. And, and that means a lot to me. That's great. Thanks, Susan. Brent. Did you want to add? Um, yeah, I, I would say, I mean, definitely had students talk to me after class or after the semester and tell me that, again, the team-based work was just a favorite thing. They loved that. That was the most exciting part of the class, that they stayed friends with the other members of their team, they made, gave them a partner throughout the semester. So I think that, and, and then we did a study where we showed that they actually learned better when they were working in these teams as opposed to individually. So um, I, yeah, I think it's through conversations. I mean, we did some formal soliciting of feedback as well, but th those are basically consistent with that. Anyone else? No? Okay. Another question? Okay, then I'll ask a question. <laughs> so, this question, honestly, I can't answer, but I'm curious to hear what you all might have to say. What kinds of teaching innovations could you envision happening, say, over the next five years or next 10 years here at Columbia? Who would like to, who would like to start on that? No one. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll say something. So I think when I started this, it's the same problem we still have, which is you can get onto YouTube and you can watch people talking about whatever you're interested in. You can learn anything, basically, on YouTube. So biochemistry, organic chemistry, general, you know, any pre-med curriculum. So we charge a lot of money to come to Columbia. At some point, a certain percentage of people are going to say, what is it worth? What is the value added of coming to an institution like Columbia? And of course, there'll always be people who are, or don't ask that question. But I think a, an increasing number will ask that question. And we have to be asking ourselves, what is the value added that, uh, of being here physically at Columbia? So that was part of my original motivation to think about what can we do differently from just giving a lecture. And I think, you know, my prediction will be we'll see more of that, whether it's, it's kind of interactive communities of learners or technologies that are in the classroom that allow people 
to do things they couldn't do on their own, but ways that were taking advantage of being physically together in the university, in the classroom, I think will be important. Very interesting. Other thoughts? I know that you are very interested in this and that there's already work in this space, but that AI space um, <laughs> is growing. I can't even imagine what the questions will be in five, 10 years or how it's going to interface with mm -hmm. physical therapy practice. Um, but I, I, I know that I'm going to need to integrate AI into my teaching somehow because it's going to be integrated into clinical practice in the future somehow. So um, haven't thought about it yet specifically, but I know it's on the horizon. I mean, one of the, one of the things that we struggle with quite a bit uh, is when teaching large classes, you have mm. students with very different levels of preparation. Um, and I, I guess in, in, in theory, there's, um, you know, there, there are, there's a lot of material available so students who are driven, motivated, can certainly make use of all of this, but it somehow doesn't happen. I can't tell you how many Coursera-like courses I signed up for and didn't complete. And so, and so <laughs> you know, this is, uh, so, so I think on the one hand, we, we see that with all, all of these advances, that we should make more progress on personalized learning, that somehow structuring the material, the assignments, mm -hmm. to help someone who's at a certain level to bring them up, and that's this different for different students, even within the same class. Um, I, so I don't know that that is going to happen, but I would hope that there's some progress on, on something like that. That would be fantastic. And it kind of connects to what Brent was saying, that what's the value added of being here? If you can get that kind of personalized support, right? And that kind of help making your way through a path that may not be as easy for you as for somebody else in the class. That's a huge value added right there. Yeah. Susan, did you have any other thoughts to add? Well, I appreciate the AI reflections, of course, but also the personalized learning. I, I was gonna say that the, one, of the, one of the struggles I have as, as um, an instructor trying to be innovative is that the innovations, for example, around um, DEI, you know, I know Laurel's the head of DEI, and uh, we're facing, um, we're coming into maybe maybe a year, two years, 10 years, we're coming into a decade where how we consider universal design and learning in, in our mm -hmm. classrooms, but also how we prepare materials and teach to um, many different identities, uh, social identities, and the way in which we um, have power and ability to, as faculty members in a classroom, make decisions around that may be challenged. So our innovations may have to become more advocacy oriented in terms of what we're allowed to do and, and how best um, we can approach um, teaching across um, classroom needs. So just, just some food for thought. Yes, and, and that's really interesting too, because it's part of the conversation that's evolved here of how important it is to know who your students are and to know what it is they need in order to be able to learn in the ways that will help them be successful. So that's, thank you for that, Susan. Can I add to that? Mm -hmm. Yes, so I, I think it reminds me of something I thought about over the years, which is the best thing for students is just sitting down one-on-one -on -one in office hours and going over the material, the concepts, their questions, their struggles, the back and forth with the instructor who knows this vast amount of information but doesn't know how to maybe know what the issues are and then having the student ask detailed questions and then all the misconceptions become uncovered. And so that, that is the best thing for them, but we can only do that one at a time. And so how do you scale that? That's a big question for the future? How do you mm -hmm. sort of integrate what we heard, Laurel, about AI and bigger classes? Right. So how do we scale that kind of personal interaction? That's an excellent question. And I hope it will get answered in the next five to 10 years. Yeah. I know that we have some uh, awardees, past awardees sitting in the audience. Would any of you like to share a thought on what you might 
think about in terms of innovation in the next five to 10 years? All right, here comes your microphone, Peter. Peter Susser, Senior Lecturer, Music Department. Um, you mentioned innovation and you mentioned how things might change over the next five to 10 years. The music department has the desire to become more available to the larger community. And that means incorporating pedagogies involving music outside the classical music realm. We are all experts in our fields and we have expertise that suggests we are uh, required, responsible for a very strict amount of information to be shared. I am eager to learn more from other dis disciplines and departments to find out how uh, we can inspire change in our department that doesn't lose sight of expertise, but becomes more welcoming of different types of, uh, different types of expertise and experience. We would like more students in the music department, and yes, this is an advertisement for the music department. <laughs> Thank you, and I'd love to tell you how much I love CTL, but that can wait till the party afterward. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. <laughs> I saw a hand in the back there. I'm Jacqueline Cofield, a doctoral candidate at Teachers College, working with AAA DS and the Heyman uh, Center on um, uh, the project Afro Franco Spears. And so, my answer for our project, we are decentering um, the Anglophone in. Uh, Black studies, and so our project has to do with um, the Francophone uh, black histories, and um, also part of it is place-based. So as we have a component where we're taking graduate students to Paris um, and, and producing a symposium in Paris in uh, April. So on the one hand, we're collaborating um, cross-departmentally uh, with faculty to design or a core course. Um, here at Columbia, but we're also um, taking graduate students uh, who may be, you know, able to teach the course uh, in the future. Um, we have professors that are providing modules, so that type of collaboration, bringing them together to ideate and um, deliver uh, possibly this, um, this curriculum, um, but also the part where we go to Paris and we bring the students and give them um, faculty uh, that are based in Paris, students, graduate students in Paris, paired them up as well to get fear, uh, feedback on their research projects. And so those are the two things that I've, I feel are innovative about our project. Thank you, that's a wonderful example and it really brings up sort of this interdisciplinary kind of effort, um, cross-location, so geographical. Um. Can I? Sure, you okay. wanna make say something? Sure. I just wanted to give a quick plug to Solaire, which is the Science mm -hmm. of Learning initiative. And uh, Adam Brown, some of you probably know, is, I think he's here somewhere over oh, there. there he is. Uh, and if you're looking for help with any of these evaluation of these projects, they're a great resource to mm -hmm. turn to, and they're willing to work with anybody here. So. And you can apply for a Solaire grant, too. That's part of the Provost grants now. Hi, thank you for such a nice panel. I'm Pam Cook from Teachers College, Columbia University. What I would love us to work towards as a university is more opportunities for collaborations across courses from different departments. I think it builds on what Peter was just saying. Um, I know I did that once and it was by chance that another faculty member was teaching a course at the same time as my course, which made it easier. But the students did a group project together and learned from each other and learned the different perspectives. And I think in our future interdisciplinary world, particularly now at the Climate School at Columbia, mm -hmm. that would be an amazing thing if we could figure out ways that we could cross-pollinate courses together. Thank you. And that's why the Provost Office now has an interdisciplinary teaching grant. <laughs> so yes, dream big. <laughs> Hi, my name is Sharon Akabis, and uh, I'm actually here to give Laurel Abrazizi a big hug, so I can tell you it's not as satisfying to be sitting here looking at her on a screen, but I'll follow up what Pam said. We, Laurel and I, have done uh, a lot of work together interdisciplinary. We had a grant up at the Medical Center. Um, we have a lot probably to say about that. I'd like to respond to the AI question, and it reminds me a little bit of the challenges we have in the field of nutrition where uh, there's the opportunity to market 
nutrition supplements with virtually no regulation. In fact, we could probably come up with a very profitable supplement here in this room and sell it. It doesn't need pre-market approval, and it would require centralized reporting that there were adverse effects to this nutritional supplement. And we have a perfectly good dietary pattern that Dr. Contento, who's sitting near me, and my wonderful mentor, uh, we, could, we could come up with that, and the challenges are really how to help people uh, adhere to that diet. So with respect to AI, we have terrific educational systems. And my worry is that AI is going to supersede a lot of these excellent systems that we have. And as with the nutritional supplement industry, with, with no regulation. So my recommendation to CTL is to form some centralized bank where professors can share upsides and downsides. Because just like with nutritional supplements, there, there is judicious use. And I suppose there's judicious use with AI. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Sharon, and nice to see you. Um, yes, that's a, a great idea. Thank you for that. Anyone else? Certainly. Let's get the microphone. Um, so, uh, Mark from the ISSO, and I had a question about everyone's take on AI and um, how you think it's like threatening or um, hindering the social aspects needed for students and faculty to come together and build these types of things that you're talking about. And for me, when I was like a young kid in school, I learned most education on like the playground at recess, like interacting with my peers and reaching out to my teachers and things like that. Do you wonder where we're going with AI and automation and all this stuff? That some of that, like real personal aspect of like people that is getting threatened. Would any of the panelists like to respond to the, the question? Yeah, I guess um, in terms of AI, I mean, I'll, I'll say that I, I graduated from my class. It, it did have an impact. I'm not teaching it now, but I did start to have students do more collaborative work at home and not in a timed on your own in an exam because some students struggled in that format. And, and so that worked well for a time that they could do problems at home in teams. They had like problem sets and exams they could do at home in teams. And then two problems emerged. So the first one wasn't AI. It was that larger and larger numbers of students started working together <laughs> until the entire class met and solve the problems as one group of 60 students or 70 students. And that wasn't what was intended. Um, and then <clears throat> with uh, ChatGPT, then I realized that we couldn't do that anymore, obviously. So we have to ask different kinds of questions that can outthink ChatGPT. So I think it's, it's partly rethinking, yeah, the things you're trying to get the students to answer. But it will get harder and harder because there will be a point where you, maybe you can't outthink a, a well-trained AI. So uh, I think it's still an open question how you can leverage that. Mm -hmm. But I think it is up to us as instructors also how we talk to our students about AI and the use of AI, how we use it perhaps in some of our classes to help them understand better the pluses and minuses that it brings into the space, the learning space in particular. So I think we have some ability to teach a generation of people, perhaps, how not to lose the personal, I hope. Yeah. Thomas. Um, Tom Grohl uh, from SIPA. Uh, I have questions of thoughts you have, given the transitional changes that we discuss or hypothesize, the experiences from the pandemic and the movement towards active learning, having more one-on-one, -on -one, uh, where you see where we are standing with our space, our physical space on campus, um, in interactions of smaller classes, larger classes, the ability to move chairs around sometimes, um, spaces where students can interact, uh, where do you see where campus might be? Well, there's, uh, 
I think it's, it's not news that we are short on good physical space for all sorts of uh, interactions. I think um, most of the classes in, in my department, one cannot run uh, small group discussions just because we don't have that sort of space. I don't have a solution other than just agreeing that, uh, yes, that, that's an important investment mm -hmm. for the university, in my opinion. Well, I'll tell you a sad story. I'll probably get in trouble for this story. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> I, I served on a committee that just was determining what to do with a new classroom that was being constructed from an old space that was being reconfigured to make a classroom. <clears throat> and I said, we should make it flexible so you can have kind of interactive group learning. But at the end of the day, that's going to reduce the capacity. And that was basically the trade-off we had to make. And at that time, the provost, made, it was a different provost, made the decision we have to maximize the density because that was, that was really the need. We just did not have enough classrooms for 100 plus students. And, and it wouldn't matter if we had this flexible classroom. So I don't think we're going to make progress on that, I would say, until we can meet the need just to have physical spaces for large classrooms. And then we'll have to construct these more flexible classrooms. I can say surely this conversation has happened at every university that I have worked at. It's really a tough one. I'd love to comment. Mm -hmm. I, my class size is 70, and I feel like there's no reason to teach in person unless there is going to be interaction amongst the students with each other. Otherwise, if it's just a passive lecture, then it could have, it could be online or recorded. So it hurts my PT brain when I see them gathering in groups to discuss and they're twisting in these chairs that don't move or they're in fixed seating and they're not in classroom spaces where the that they can readjust and form into small groups. So I do hope that if we are valuing, you know, the, the collaborative learning um, that we've been promoting over the years and learning from each other and from the people in those spaces and adding in that layer of, you know, the lived experiences of the people in the room and positionality and all of that that comes with dialogue and 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 community and the space needs to facilitate that. So um, yeah. I, I now teach, I break my class into four smaller groups teaching. So I now, just to make sure that I can maximize participation and get one of those rooms where the, the chairs move um, so that I have them in a large space and then again in smaller spaces just to do that. I would say that what Laurel just described is one of the biggest challenges that we face in the work of promoting teaching innovation. It's very hard for people to innovate in spaces that don't allow for active learning activities or students to collaborate easily. And it's a systemic problem. And I do hope maybe that'll be an innovation in the future that we can look forward to. Thomas, thank you for raising that. All right, I think we have wrapped up an amazing conversation. I wanna thank our panelists who were so generous in sharing their time and their thoughts. And also thank the audience for being so engaged and helping us think through all of these big questions in teaching and learning at Columbia. Thank you all. Thank you.